Good afternoon, good afternoon. Welcome to Thriving in Abundance Talk. Of course, we are in uh, Women's Month as August in South Africa. We're celebrating women and uh, as our talk show, this time we have a special series that focuses on the marketplace and it is my absolute pleasure this afternoon to welcome Miss C. Bu C. C. We Lynette Ntuli. <laughs> Some of us have got the license to use these words. <laughs> Welcome, Lin Lin. We can't hear you. Thank you so much for having me this afternoon. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And how are you? Good, you can see me and Jay Mabu Benjalo. Mabu Benjalo. We have to be excited. Bagiti Women's Month is now Pella. Say, Sizala in lockdown. So, now just as we begin our talk uh, this afternoon, I just would like to read uh, from the book of James. Of course, the ancient book is the one that guides us. The book of James 2, verse 26. For as the body, without the spirit is dead so faith without works is dead also so we can't just say we move by faith <laughs> we move by faith but we have to work as well so that we can be able to realize these things so um this afternoon ladies and gentlemen i've got to lynette and to oh, babes we're infrastructure <laughs> oh, babes we're property Oh, babes, <laughs> with youth economic development. Oh, babes, where's in the zone? Is the passage? Lynn, welcome again. Thank you, thank you. You know, can you? I would just like us to maybe start uh, from the, you know, from the from from the beginning, the basics. Who is Lynette? As in, Usukapi. Hey, Lynette is a. Young woman from humble beginnings in Mlazi and Durban, um, who, as you've just opened for us, just loves the work that she does, um, tries to empower others through the work um, and the things that she's interested in, um, you know, enjoys life, um, enjoys all that life has to offer, and looks forward to so many things as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So as you know, I'm actually always curious because um, I can recall that you guys went to, a, you know, those kind of schools back then. Um, <laughs> I can actually, I do, I've got a picture seeing you, Emma's grave <laughs> with your mom. <laughs> and I was already like working at the time. So you see some dollar. And I'm just like curious to know what, how was it like growing up in that kind of environment, you know, where you are in one uh, uh, environment uh, and then a different environment, you know, um, you know, just like tell us a little bit more about that. You know, in hindsight, and I think because of the things that have been happening in 2020 and the discussion yeah. around mm -hmm. growing up in those two worlds, it was genuinely, yeah. it was straddling two worlds. Um, you wake up in Mlazi, which, um, you know, and I guess some of us were, you know, we're not about 2000, we were born during apartheid, saw the transition and then came and finished school in a free South Africa. So you wake up in this one condition of the world. Yeah. Yeah. And by half past seven that morning, you exist in this other world, in this other cocoon, um, mm -hmm. an other reality. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, as children, you learn then to balance the two. It's not always straightforward. It's not always easy. It's not always understood. And there's a lot of complexity and a lot of very fast growing up that has to happen for you as children. But I think we were maybe cushioned from a lot of, you know, I think a lot of the instability that can come from, there's just that daily volatility as it were. Um, by the home we grew up in, you know, I think our parents were very intentional about why we were being sent to those schools at the time. 
And so in many ways, I think they were also quite aware of what they were also putting us into. You know, they were taking us from one world daily and moving us into another and back on a daily basis. So then what do you then have to create those constants and balance and um, support, you know, so that we're not, we're not too shaken by the system as it were. And I think that was useful for us um, to have parents who were very intentional in terms of their um, support, in terms of the guidance, and also just in terms of our schooling journey, you know. Um, you know, I don't remember not having um, initially both my parents and then later on my mom not present in our school lives, whether it was school events, meetings, homework, participating in our projects and the things that we were interested in. And that was important for us because I think as young people who were almost growing up in a very volatile and a confusing time, that was important. Um, it's sad in 2020 to see that many of the same struggles we faced then are still prevalent and relevant now. But I think it's been also great to go back as old girls and older girls and yeah. really support yeah. the yeah. amplification of the issues and the voices of the young women who are still the young men and women who are still in the system, but mm -hmm. also go back and start saying to even some of us who are parents, some of us who are aunts, some of us who are now older and saying, it's important guys to not just let your money do the talking, but these are the things you need to be aware of, especially if you didn't go through a system, the system, yeah. but now you've put your children into it. These are the yeah. type of conversations you need to be having. And this is the type of involvement that is required from us because, you know, these are our schools too. You know, um, I think everybody starts that whole discussion and discourse around, well, let's open our own schools. No, 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 no. Those are our schools too. And it's how to get involved in the system that changes them. Yeah. Wow, 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 wow. That's very interesting. Yeah, it's quite an interesting one. That one, obviously, one has got kids that, um, you know, I still have a child that's in metric. And, um, you know, she's had, you know, challenges and instances where she literally has to leave a school that we were so looking forward to her, uh, you know, exploring her high school and ed education in, in that school. And we, we, we just had to, you know, listen to her sentiments and yeah. basically just do what she wanted us to do because otherwise it would have been a frustrating experience for her. But I mean, I think I would like to probably just um, get it from you. Like what sort of advice would you give to parents that were not probably woke to these things um, before what we've now experienced in 2020? And I think if you are not <laughs> mindful and woke as a parent, uh, like it, really you know what i'm saying so but what would mm -hmm. what would you what would you advise i think definitely listen firstly listen to your child don't yeah. don't um don't dismiss your child's experiences and what they're trying to share with you and i yes. think that's critically important you know we grew up in a time where because the environment um, on how the country ran and the, the, the almost the privilege of being in those spaces. You mm. grew up almost with the sense of that you were lucky to be there. Mm. Mm. And our parents then typically transfer that you should be grateful that you are in those environments and those schools and, and that. And sometimes you're going through really painful things because you're also thinking about, Ish, people are sacrificing for me to be there. Mm. Um, and you know me, I'm very vocal about there must never be any amount of position, title, money, that sort of thing that makes you suffer any indignity and yeah. disrespect, etc. And I think for parents, it's, it's important to listen. I think the mm. second thing that's really important is that the school environments that in many instances we've transitioned, um, and I can say our Black children into rely on parental involvement and it means parental involvement is not just being the mom who is chair of the pta or the one who runs the bake sales and everything else it is communicating with that child's teachers it is pitching on practice and sitting on the sideline it is advocating for your child's needs it is 
um, you know, it is reading circulars, it is touching base with the school on the things that you have questions about. If your child in 2020 does not have more than one or two black teachers or female teachers or male teachers or diversity in their class, why on earth are you not questioning that? Because you question that everywhere else. You question it in your career, you question it in your corporates, you question government. Why are you not questioning it where your child is being grown? So it's about involvement. So for me, those are really the two things. Listen, get involved. Mm, mm, mm. Wow! Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we've got we've got to cut it out for 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 us parents. Let's let's get involved and let's listen to our children and not just you know always say the things that you were referring to about uh, being grateful and about being lucky and all those things. You know, you mentioned uh, uh, an issue of um, indignity and uh, related stuff. So I've seen you also being vocal about the issue of gender-based violence. We are in Women's Month in South Africa. So I'd just like to uh, get briefly your, your views on the issue of gender-based violence. Oh, well, I'm, I'm also, as, you, as many people know, currently also just working through the system as well because of a, of a matter I'm involved in. Mm -hmm. And um, against that, I'm just vehemently outraged um, by the fact that as women, we have to go through that, we have to be subjected to that, and that we just don't have adequate resources and the system doesn't adequately support us as women. But, you know, I think the other really, really important thing is that as much as the only way the system changes is if the system sees pressure coming from women. Yeah. And I think what then typically happens is that, you know, as women, we suffer in silence. Um, and in many instances, we don't then come back to report different cases and issues. And that is critically important that we do that critically important that we do that. Because if you report, we then have the right statistics. Statistics inform resources, resources inform action, action informs results. And I think we've almost got to encourage women to say, don't be quiet. And I think it's important what's happening now in the discourse and the augmented anger that we feel and sense in the system right now, it's critically important. But also more than that, we've also got to start encouraging to say, okay, let's get organized. And organized becomes that. It becomes, let's produce numbers, let's produce um, policies, and, 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 and that is what's going to help us drive forward. Yeah, yeah. All right. Perfect, perfect. If you were to have an audience uh, with the minister and the president, the minister that's responsible for women and children, um, what, what, what would be the three things that you would want her to agently address during Women's Month? I would definitely say, if, and I had to have an urgent address, it would be to say, reform the system. Our laws are, are just completely dis and misaligned from the reality and the extent of the reality that yeah. women are currently experiencing. Yeah. I wouldn't even go into saying, hey, let's improve. I think they've tried to improve, but because there are just so many fractures in the system, it requires complete reform, whether it is from policing, the criminal justice process and system, everything. It just re it requires everybody just to say, stop, what are we doing here? Because it's all not working. And it seems like the more they intervene and the more they add and the more they try to come and bring it together, it's almost making it worse because then there's a lot of policy confusion there's a lot of resource confusion. There's a lot of even criminal justice confusion because even in terms of precedents and how they're applied and the subjective application of the law related to these issues. Yeah, you know, it's, just, it's, it's part of the big reason why women are not getting justice. So I would just almost say to them, yo, pull the pin out the grenade and start again. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anything else? No, um, that, really, yeah? really, you know, it's, it's intolerable. Um, you yeah. Know, I yeah. My yeah. Longer on this. It's intolerable. And yeah. I think it's really important that, you know, we don't only talk about it in Women's Month. Um, and it's not a woman's issue. Um, yeah. Women aren't killing women. 
Um, and if, we're, if men are going to really say they are our allies, mm -hmm. then they need to step up differently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. I see most of them want to do something, but they're paralyzed by various issues and factors, and they get that. But, yeah. And they're fearful of even sometimes expressing ourselves themselves because we're so angry. But we're angry because we're in danger and we live scared. Um, and I need them to feel like as scared as we are. I need them, if they lived in the same jacket of fear and anxiety that we consistently do, they would be angrier too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. if they're going to ally, I think they need to ally also just as decisively, just in the yeah. same organized manner. Yeah. And vocally, yeah. that's, you know, our cousin in Abu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Offer yeah. each other a lot of social protection. Um, you know, and until it's your sister, until it's your daughter, you know, it's like nothing irritates me more than a man who says, I'm the father of a daughter. But you were a mother's son before that. You were a wife's partner. You were somebody's brother. And now all of a sudden, because there's something of you, this is your issue. Wow, where have you been all your life? You know? <laughs> Yeah, so I think it becomes critically important for them to ally yeah, that way. Yes, yes, yes. And actually, you know, participate, you know, actively and be intentional about it. Yeah. Matota, mm. Matota, Matota Paraman, Matota Paraman, Matota Paraman, this is the time. Now coming back to um, the property space. So what uh, brings you to this sector, Lynette? Very much by error, I ended up yeah. in the sector and in the space. Um, I had a very different career path, but I'm so grateful for it. I'm, I'm yeah. grateful for it because um, it brought me into a space where one can make transformative impact, um, really work in an untouched and untapped area of our economy, and really introduce new and fresh ideas. Um, I'm still 15 years deep. I'm still really excited about the work that I get to do. 15 years deep, I'm still really excited about what we can continue to do. Um, yeah. And that's something that I think I'd like to get a lot more people excited about because I think also a lot of yeah. us grow up with the paradigm around property and when we think about infrastructure, we either think of a government, or we think yeah. of a big piece of land or a farm or something. And I'm yeah. saying, no, guys, this is value chain related to this thing. Um, and that's almost the value chain that you want everybody else to be excited about as well, because yeah, it keeps yeah. the whole environment um, yeah. sustainable. So yeah. yeah, so that's how I end up in it. All right, all right. Yeah, I remember reading that article back then and I was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> she's already working and she's managing a shopping center, wow. <laughs> Amazing, amazing, and congratulations, you've really done well in that space. But then, I mean, you're talking about it being a value chain, and I'm sure there are young people out there that are interested to participate in this um, sector, but they actually do not know um, where to start. So where does one begin? I think read and research. Read. Um, you know, I always say that to people, that right? if you don't know what you don't know, you don't know. <laughs> read and research about the, the, the whole sector, the industry, how it interacts, even with different sectors. It's really been interesting for me to see people who come from completely unrelated sectors come into our sector because they join a skill or an experience or a, a, an attribute of what they're doing elsewhere and they are able yeah. to make it worthwhile in our yeah. sector. And that's yeah. actually how a lot of people get into property. Um, property is not something you grow up with as a career of choice. A lot of people kind of stumble into it and then they make the best of it. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, you can study degrees, BSc degrees yeah. in property yeah. studies, and all of those type of things, but that's new yeah. and that's recent. Yeah. But most of us have gotten into it as an almost a, a progression or a, a lateral move from one other thing to something else. Um, so I always say to everybody, just read. Um, figure out what you're interested in. How do you take what you know now and into the space and then how you're going to apply it? So just think things through. Um, I think that's also it. I think people expect sometimes that there's like a magic door yeah. and a place where you knock and a place where you start. Not really. Um, everybody that's in property today that you talk to came in differently. Some came through a front door, others through a window, others through the chimney. 
nobody comes in <laughs> it's not like being a doctor you know where everybody comes through medical school then there's an internship and then and then every everybody has, has their own story about how they ended up in the game and yeah. so you've got to take responsibility for your entry point and then you've got to take responsibility for your journey and what you will make of yeah. your participation and contribution so that's what i always say to everyone is do that oh. Okay, it's very interesting. And how is the participation of women in this um, sector, you know, especially in, in, in South Africa and probably the continent at, at large? How, how are we doing as women? I think a lot better than we were when I arrived, which, yeah, um, yo, that was dismal times. <laughs> um, and it's really great to see the type of community that women in the different spaces and disciplines of the whole built environment have created. Mm -hmm. And it continues to grow. It's really nice to see younger people come into the fray as well. Um, mm -hmm. And across demographics, mind you, um, every race, um, from different disciplines, it's really nice to see that. But we still got a long way to go. Um, mm -hmm. We still definitely need more women in management positions and in some of the very big um, corporate structures, infrastructure. We need a lot more women in the public service who are involved in infrastructure projects and mm. in the lay of the land. Because, you know, you hear about the big transport projects, water projects, power projects, and you're like, so where are the women in this? And we don't yeah. have enough. We should be, that's where, that's where we should all want to play, you know, yeah. because that's our country. Um, so we definitely need more women with technical skills there. Um, we definitely need to make sure that um, a lot more young women come in so that, you know, you don't end up with the situation where, for instance, now when you look at sort of the listed boards and in the property sector, you've only got sort of two, three female CEOs at, at our, in our property construction built environment, in, environment. And you've got still very few even chairmen of boards and, and the representation of boards in this particular space. So we definitely need, you know, women who also want to stay. You know, this is, I say to people, if you're gonna get into property, you're gonna get into infrastructure, you wanna get into the built environment, it's not a short game, it's a long game. And yeah. so you wanna stay, yes, and you're gonna do maybe different things, but we need more women to stay. Um, and yeah. to stay the course because that succession gives us a better chance and of representation at all kinds of levels and in all kinds of transactions, you know, so that's important as well. Mm, mm, mm. And what has been your biggest hurdle so far? I'm sure there's been quite a lot, but the one that when you think about, you're like, oh my goodness, I almost, you know, you know, uh, threw in the towel. I think definitely the deficit of trust. Um, you know, deficit of trust, I, I, I walk into very big boardrooms. <laughs> Um, as a very young, very black, very bald, although I've got more hair. <laughs> very vocal. <laughs> and very vocal and opinionated and experienced yeah. young black woman. Yeah. And in many instances still in our sector um, and at the very different levels of transformation that still need to occur, nobody's, nobody is still waiting or expecting you. Um, which is almost scary. And then of course, when you know you walk into these rooms and you're sitting at the table and you're delivering value um, or you're pitching something, you're asking for mountains of money. <laughs> Cause you know, our industry as well is not like a 10,000 rand industry. It's one of those industries where you sit at the table and you're like, so you can trust me with your half a billion rand. <laughs> and you know, Anybody say yeah, about is, half million is Mali. Yeah, exactly. You know, so <laughs> Imali, and you know, people entrust us with their assets, um, three billion, four billion rand assets. People entrust us with those things. So when you now need to consider the value of the game you're playing in versus almost the placement of and the perception around women in leadership, young women, young black African women, the exposure to the captains of the game versus mm. us, the fairly new were entrants. You've got a deficit there of both knowledge and trust and community. And in many instances, that will be the thing that will be the decider between 
you're getting it and you're not. Mm. Not that you're confident, not that you haven't ticked every box, not that you haven't jumped over every hoop loop. And if not twice over, it'll be in my gut. Is it that conviction? Um, and that, yo, that's just human nature. Um, and you've got to yeah. then hope that as you enter some of these rooms and you have these conversations in those spaces, that you're emotionally intelligent, not just mentally intelligent, but you're also mm. emotionally intelligent yeah. to connect with the people in the room in such an, a way that that trust, that relational trust can be built. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's very interesting, <laughs> the element of emotional intelligence and be able to connect with, with, uh, with, with people. Both the, no one will teach you that. Certainly, there's no cause like that, whether you've started anything that's related to, to, to built environment. So, yeah, it, it, it comes with experience, and I think it comes with being um, emotionally mature, I would imagine. So, yeah, all right. Perfect. That's uh, very interesting. So, so now, what is the situation um, in the industry currently as we are going through what we're going through in the world now with COVID-19 and like, wow, <laughs> like in my industry, we've just like, bleak. We it's, eh? bleak. it's bleak. Bleeding. Yeah. yeah. Bleak. Um, bleak. You know, just after tourism, the event industry property is right down there. Ah, um, okay. Yeah. It is. And it's simply because we in our business relies on people's ability to occupy space. Yes. What are we all being told? Vacate space and go home. Yeah. So that impact is huge. Huge, huge, huge. Um, you know, if you read the, the, the news on a daily basis, and it just tells you the type of battering the industry and the industry's value chain is currently taking right now, it's bad. It's really, really bleeding. It's bad in, you know, just the type of devaluations and payments that we're seeing coming through rentals that are being lost, um, acquisitions, transactions that have now had to stop all those type of things. It all ultimately boils down to your ability to occupy space. And everybody's yeah. saying, oh, gosh, yeah. guys, we can't go back. Yeah. To yeah. occupying space, we need less space now because of operational reasons, economic reasons, and 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 it's mm -hmm. made it a very, very, very difficult um, position to be in. And of course, you know, in every sector of property as well, retail is down. All we really want to do is go out, get our groceries, and go home. You know, um, yeah. residential is down. People are losing jobs. People are unable to secure bonds and that sort of thing. You know, and that's a problem and a crisis on its own. Um, you know, so industrial is down. Um, if there's disinvestment, we can't get exports in, et cetera, et cetera. But that also comes down. So student accommodation, which was like everybody's big boon yeah. in 2018 and 2019. It was exciting. <laughs> exciting. There are no students on campus. They're all at home. You know, and just like yeah. that. Yeah. You know, you feel, yeah. Little, yeah. So it's difficult. It is. It is. What? What do? What? What would if you were to uh, design a safe survival toolkit? What? What? What would be in that toolkit? Um, I would definitely say resilience. resilience. I would definitely, yeah. I would definitely say resilience. I would definitely say um, also with resilience. Um, you know, you need to now think around the skill set that you have and how it can be applied differently. I would definitely say, um, and, and I think also start thinking past to this point. The world will come back in one way, format or the other. And you've already then got to be saying, okay, what are my losses, but also what are my new gains? And then cut off towards that. So I would definitely say that that's important. Wow. All right. And uh, I mean, like if you were to probably think of the time frame, you know, um, of course, I mean, like this is just like, you know, uh, could be a thumbs up. When mm. do you think we would uh, or the industry will, will, you know, sort of come back to to where it currently was or at least progress towards that? 2021. 
2021. Yeah. I think, you know, we've got to um, all wait for a vaccine because that's important. Mm -hmm. um, we're about to obviously go back into summer. Europeans are about to go into probably a phase two with the resurgence mm -hmm. because of the new Euro winter. We still don't have a vaccine. Yeah. Um, and we're still going to see, we don't understand this disease. <laughs> So we're going to see all kinds of things, I think, with it still. It's August. I can't believe it's August. We've been at home since March. Um, yeah. So it tells me that we also got to apply patience. And we've got to be pragmatic about that patience. And we've yeah. just got to start saying, how do you get out of this alive? How do you get out of this healthy? And how do you get out of this ready to start again in another space and, and set normal? So I would definitely say by the time the world, I think, is more settled, it'll definitely be sort of the first quarter of the new year when, you know, we've definitely probably got at least the first run of a vaccine. We've got um, education back, um, you know, I think always with education, we've got less pressure on the health system. And then I think then you can recalibrate an economy. Mm, mm. Wow. All right. So that's interesting. But at least it's 2021, you know, because at some point, like we had this uh, conversation with you and you were telling me about the different, <laughs> you know, um, how the, the, the disease is manifesting differently in other people and all sorts of things. And, you know, after that conversation, I was like, my goodness, what are we getting into? You know, <laughs> yeah, we, don't yeah. know we don't know, you know, we don't yeah. know. We don't know. So we've got to be yeah. that's why everybody just got to be pragmatic, but we've also got to be yeah. patient. This, this yeah. is beyond all of our intelligence right now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It is it's definitely beyond um, all our intelligence right now. So if you're not, um, I know you are a, allow me, because it's me, you are a nerd. So most of the time you spend reading and writing. <laughs> but I mean, we're on lockdown. You can only do so much of that. So, <laughs> and of course, oh my goodness, she was a head girl <laughs> at college. And a coat that she used to wear then so many years back, it still fits her. You know, when I saw that, I was like, please, Linz, just stop. <laughs> For some so if you're not reading or writing, what, what do you do? What, like, what, what excites you? Man, I wish the world outside was open. <laughs> because um, oh, yeah, I, love, the I love outside. I love outside. Um, I love to, I mean, I, I love to travel. I, I love sport. Um, I love to be active. Um, so for me, this is like, yo, this has been a big game changer yeah. to be confined to one space, my luggage probably thinks I've died. <laughs> so does my passport. Um, so, <laughs> you know, so I love, I love those things. Um, but I think, you know, also, um, it's been also really great to have this much time at home. Um, because if you mean you're out in the world, all the time and you literally start to treat your home like a, 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 a hostel, a, a station where you change bags, you sleep a night or two and you keep it moving. Oh man, so what I've really enjoyed about lockdown is also just the opportunity to sleep in one common bed for as long as I have. This is probably the yeah. longest I've slept in my bed ever. <laughs> <laughs> ever. <laughs> Um, oh, that was the year that you just literally lived in in airports like yeah. like i think a year before last like you were here and then the next thing you yeah. are there and the next thing you are there you know but yeah oh my goodness so, so, yeah. this has been this has been a a, a a wonderful privilege um as well to mm. and i say a wonderful privilege um to know now that all of that work and running around has also given me the opportunity to set, settle at home and, and just enjoy home and being at home um, in my own space um, and in my own comfortable space and, you know, be able to go outside and sit in the garden and drink a cup of coffee and process my thoughts and yeah. think, oh, you know, I should really plant that <laughs> in there and, you know, Hey, I have plants, you know, I can plant oh, things. Oh. Actually, I do <laughs> even have a garden. <laughs> yeah, you know, I can plant things. And you see things yeah. around your own home, man. 
you know, yeah. some things that you take for granted. Um, yeah. Like, you know, load, like every week have your own chores in your own home. Cook. Yeah. yeah. Cook. Oh, I you know. know. When I spoke to you the other day, I'm like, I'm busy and with laundry. And I was like, mm, yeah. laundry. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying that simplicity of if, yeah. you know, I can do those things because in the past mm. it was literally an ongoing train. So you can cook a meal from scratch and you have time to do that. Um, ah, I'm coming You know, and <laughs> I yeah. enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, I enjoy it, but I don't have time. So it's wonderful to do that and, yeah. and eat it and enjoy it. Um, you know, um, you know to, to do your own things as well. You know, to sit and do your own laundry. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> Hi, 2020. <laughs> and, you know, you load your own machine and all yeah. of those. I'm enjoying that. I'm really, yeah. I'm really also enjoying mm. that. So yeah. I don't feel like completely lost in the world now because if there's no outside world. Of course I miss it. Mm. But also there's a very specific reason that this time has existed. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, no, that's very true. That's very true. I think we're all in that space where we really, really, uh, as much as obviously we're suffering to a certain extent in terms of income and stuff like that, but we're enjoying the moment, moment to just be, you know, uh, and it, it really, it gives us more time also to have conversations yeah. with our maker, which I think is very important because otherwise we can go different directions where he wants us to go to this direction and then to now, this is Kantata says, they are going in direction. So I've personally also found this time to be quite useful. All right. Now, patent shot. What would you say to, I know you're quite uh, uh, passionate about young people. You have uh, participated in um, uh, my daughter's programs and Ubuntu blessings. Uh, so to a matriculant um, who is obviously in, um, you know, doing metric during this very dicey time, got 2020, mm. um, what sort of encouragement or inspiration would you give them as a parting shot? I would say, you know, for them, I think for a lot of them, they're devastated. They're, it's such a different way to end what should almost be the highlights of your school career. Mm. But I also would say to them, they must find moments um, to celebrate those milestones differently. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They're part of such a historic year. Um, you know, the same way we read about the Spanish flu of 1918, people in time will read about the 2020 coronavirus and they mm -hmm. will have been that class, um, this mm -hmm. class of this new decade that had to do things very differently and more importantly, finished their basic education in a very different world. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, my, my, my parting shots of encouragement for them is to not be despondent. Um, they are almost the front line of a historic resetting of the world. Um, also for them, they must capture the moments and the things they learned. Um, you know, we often say to young people, ah, oh, you must be, you must be strong. You must be resilient. Life is not easy. Mm -hmm. This was a masterclass in it, yeah. masterclass yeah. in what it meant to adapt, what it meant to survive things, what it meant to be disappointed, what it meant to, you know, not get to the, it meant so much. And there's been a lot of emotions I know around it, fear, anxiety, doubt, will I, will I not? Um, and I think this has been the ultimate get ready for life masterclass. And if they can take this experience and what they learned and how they transitioned, adapted and came through it into the rest of their life, mm -hmm. they're so made. I mean, I wish I knew the things they will now know at 18, mm -hmm. at 18. Because yeah. yo, it would have saved us all our 20s and our 30s from getting so many things wrong. <laughs> and trauma, you know, the trauma of paralysis and the trauma of, they know now things that are gonna set them up to survive pretty much anything now that gets thrown at them in the next, particularly the next, I think, decade of their lives. They're gonna just flip back and remember, what did I do that year? And apply that to their problem solving, to how they overcome obstacles and hurdles, to how they apply themselves to different environments, to how they relate to other people. Yo, 
it's such a blessing. Uh, this, and this is the type of education that all 12 years of their basic education could have never provided them with. Yeah, yeah. Life, so if I were life. them, I would take this and take this moments in time and run with them. Yeah. Wow. Wow. You know, I do know that you have um, other engagements that you go into, that you need to go into. I don't know. Do you have five more minutes? Because I, do you? No, one. <laughs> All right. So, okay. What I'm, look, I mean, like, I don't know with people because they knew uh, exactly when we'll be starting, but I, I see that we have these questions only coming now. So what I'm going to do is I would rather engage you when you have time, we will send you the questions and then we will respond to these questions. It, it, it's you know? live, right, on, on, on Facebook. So I it think when I have yeah. the opportunity to do, I will join the chat as yeah. well. And I will, if everybody just stay to their questions, I'll answer them yeah. all individually. And then you'll answer the question. Okay, did you hear that? Let me see who are the people that had questions. Uh, Pumzile, there's a comment. I think Ubongi Mazala who had the most questions. So Ubongi, she will be responding to your response. Directly on the chat. Directly to you. So. I will get into that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, perfect. Thank you so much, Lynn, for your time. Uh, can you give us uh, your, your social med media handles for those that would like to maybe touch base and connect with you? Okay, um, on Instagram, I am Miss Nduli, M-S-N-T-U-L-I. Um, mm -hmm. Similarly, on LinkedIn, I'm my name, Lynette Nduli. Um, on Twitter, I'm also Miss Nduli there as well. I'm really good at interacting and my contacts and that sort of thing are also predominantly yeah. on those platforms. All right. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you so much for spending um, time with us. It is our first series for them, for this special yeah. show for, for Women's Month. <laughs> Which oh, is such, a pleasure. such a pleasure to be in the marketplace. I really enjoyed yeah. it. Thank you. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. That was Usibu CC, where <laughs> that allowed us to spend time with her, uh, you know, a very busy young lady. So we really appreciate you and we would like to wish you all the best in everything that you do, uh, Lynette. And um, yeah, may God bless you abundantly. And yeah, we love you so much. And uh, thank you so much for making the Time. My name is uh, Zotom Simange Kansibande Makoche, uh, signing off on our first show here, yeah, Women's Month, in net, um, in, 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 we're focusing on women. Uh, of course, uh, Udinet and Julie uh, that joined us this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>